The substance of Major John Cartwright's life is told on the pedestal beneath his statue in the dingy garden of Burton Crescent, to the south of Euston Road, in London. John Cartwright. The firm, consistent and persevering advocate of universal suffrage, equal representation, vote by ballot and annual parliaments. He was the first English writer who openly maintained the independence of the United States of America, and although his distinguished merits as a naval officer in 1776 presented the most flattering prospects of professional advancement, yet he nobly refused to draw his sword against the rising liberties of an oppressed and struggling people. In grateful commemoration of his inflexible integrity, exalted patriotism, profound constitutional knowledge, and in sincere admiration of the unblemished virtues of his private life, this statue was erected by public subscription near the spot where he closed his useful and meritorious career. There is nothing false or exaggerated in this epitaph. Fox, in the House of Commons, testified to Cartwright's profound constitutional knowledge. It is true that for nearly fifty years, in season and out of season, Cartwright, a pupil of Locke in politics, contended publicly for annual parliaments and what then constituted universal suffrage, claiming personality and not property as the ground for enfranchisement, and insisting that while the right of the rich and the poor to the vote was equal, the need of the latter was far greater. But this agitation was by no means the limit either of his ideas or his activities. Entering the Navy at 18, John Cartwright, who came of an old Nottingham family, devised improvements in the gun service, and made a lieutenant, was marked for high promotion. The revolt of the American colonies cut short his professional career. An innate love of liberty compelled the young naval officer to side with the colonists. Lord Howe put Cartwright's principles to the test by inviting him to join the expedition against the Americans, and Cartwright, who was passionately attached to the Navy, and had an immense admiration for Howe, could only answer that he was unable to take part in a war he thought unjust. With this refusal his naval services were ended. No sooner was he out of the Navy than, with a major's commission, he at once set to work to train the Nottinghamshire militia, only retiring from this post in 1791 when the government cancelled his appointment for attending a meeting called to celebrate the fall of the Bastille. Thirteen years before the fall of the Bastille Major Cartwright had the cap of liberty displayed on the banners and engraved on the buttons of the Nottinghamshire militia. A greater service than providing symbols of liberty was rendered to the army by Cartwright in the matter of better clothing for the men. The misery endured by ill-clad sentries aroused his compassion and indignation, and Cartwright worried the government until it provided greatcoats for all private soldiers. An untiring advocacy of democratic politics earned for Cartwright, justly, the title of the father of reform. He was the real founder of that movement for political reform, which in the 19th century swept away rotten boroughs, gave representation to all towns of importance, and extended the franchise to the great bulk of male householders in town and country. Major Cartwright began his speeches and pamphlets on behalf of political reform in 1776, just after his retirement from the Navy, and his acceptance of the commission in the militia. Unlike Thomas Paine, and many of the radical reformers, Cartwright pleads for political democracy as the natural outcome of the Christian faith, maintaining that no man can have a right sense and belief of Christianity, who denies the equality of all conditions of men. Incidentally, challenged on the point of why not votes for women. Cartwright could only fall back on certain passages in the Bible to justify his objection to women's enfranchisement. The poor, because of their very poverty, had a need for the vote and for parliamentary representation which the man of property could not experience. This Cartwright emphasized in a petition he presented to the House of Commons as late as 1820. And when your honorable house shall further consider that the humblest mortal on earth is equally a co-heir of an immortality with the most exalted who now wears stars, or coronets, or crowns, your petitioner hopes that your honorable house will rise superior to the mean thoughts and vulgar prejudices of the uncharitable among the wealthy, the ignorant, the interested, the vain, and the proud, and will acknowledge that, in reference to the respective claims of legislative representation by the poor and the rich, the poor have equal right but far more need. 
Cartwright was 80 when, with several friends, he was charged with being a malicious, seditious, evil-minded person, and with unlawfully and maliciously intending and designing to raise disaffection and discontent in the minds of His Majesty's subjects. All England knew that Major Cartwright was a single-minded and high-principled man, in whose heart was neither guile nor malice, a man who had proved his loyalty and patriotism over and over again, and was no more seditious than he was evil-minded or disaffected. Apart from his advocacy of political reform and his services to the militia, Cartwright had done much for farming and agriculture, he had helped Clarkson and Wilberforce in their anti-slavery work, and he had called the attention of the government, as loudly as he could, to the defenseless state of the East Coast against foreign invasion. Yet in 1820 a British jury, obedient to the orders of a political judge, found John Cartwright guilty of maliciously intending and designing to raise disaffection and discontent, and a fine of £100 was inflicted. By the government Cartwright stood convicted as a seditious, evil-minded person. Posterity is content to know John Cartwright by the title his contemporaries conferred upon him, the father of reform, and to rank him as the foremost man in England in the 18th century to raise the standard of political democracy.